retired colleague, was for many years lecturer in folklore and ethnology here at UCC and associate researcher at Quintal, the Laboratoire d'Anthropologie Culturelle at Université Paris Descartes Sorbonne. Originally from France, Marianique conducted fieldwork uh, in Newfoundland for her MA on the folktale tradition there <clears throat> and was subsequently awarded her PhD from Memorial University, Newfoundland for her research on the communicative traditions of French Newfoundland women. She joined UCC in 1995, where she set up the Folklore and Ethnology Archive, of which she will speak today. She was also instrumental at that time, along with Antolov Garodo Cruley, in establishing the Northside Folklore Project, later the Cork Folklore Project, of which she was research director until 2010. Her current research interests range from urban ethnology to ethnomusicology, oral history, and touching on today's topic, the digitization of multimedia folklore archive resources. And if all that's not enough, Marinique is also very active within the Irish traditional music circle as a musician and a concert organiser. And she's an excellent photographer with a keen eye for ethnographic detail. And I'm sure some of you have seen the photographs that she has shared with us over the years. So she will be joined today by Mr. James Fury, a former colleague uh, and uh, well, a present, presently a colleague and a, a former student of the, the department. Um, and uh, Marinique will bring Jamie in a little bit later on in the talk. Uh, so today's seminar is titled Sound Out and Dig In to the UCC Folklore and Ethnology Archive. Will you please give the warmest of virtual welcomes to Dr. Marinique de Planck. Well, good morning, Kiran. Um, I won't, uh, I'll continue in English uh, because uh, I'm not too good at the Irish at all. In fact, so, um, Thank you so much uh, for the welcome and um, I would like to, before I go sharing my screen, uh, I would like you maybe to pay attention to the date. It's a significant date today, the 18th of March. Um, the 18th of March is the 150th anniversary of the Commune in France in 1851, which was the first really uh, social um, revolution and workers' revolution. Uh, so I would like to uh, maybe bring uh, people's attention to that as we are going to talk about a topic that deals and refers really uh, to people, uh, to people's words really, and to people's memories and to their collective memory. So without uh, much uh, Wait, I'm going to share my screen with you <clears throat> and include computer sound uh, so that technically we are here and we are now going to sound out and dig into the folklore and ethnology archive. Uh, Hopefully, as I said to my students during the whole uh, term, last term, can you see this? Um, and I hope that you can. So I'm going to go into uh, now the slideshow. So uh, I cannot see you. We can see and, that, Marinique. Thank you. Okay, that's very good. Um, so what we are looking at here is uh, really the icon that you will find on the uh, on the website of the of uh, the um, the folklore department uh, on Rowan and Bielidus, uh here at UCC or there at UCC as it happens, um, and uh, if I click on this. Uh, lane here and on the plaque, uh, we will go straight then into, hopefully, um, the uh, website of uh, the Sound Archive and hopefully my internet will, oh no, here, I was on to them so many times that they actually are now into my computer. Uh, Okay, they are acting the gremlin, it's now air come. And so here we are um, in the Folklore and Ethnology uh, Archive at UCC, the Sound Archive. And what you see here is uh, the uh, main page 
of the website and the main interface of the website. So uh, what we will do here, what will I do is that I will um, present this very, very briefly. Uh, and later on, uh, Jamie, Jamie Fury will expand on uh, the technological dimension of it and the back end of it. And Jamie has been working with us for a very long time and he was very instrumental in setting this up really uh, himself and many others uh, in calling McHale uh, was another uh, technician who worked with this at the beginning. Um, I would like to point to the fact that without Jamie, uh, we would not be talking about folklore case here at UCC uh, today. So I think it's important to bear that in mind and to also uh, think ahead and uh, think in terms of establishing a position really uh, for an archive manager uh, in the department, uh, as Kiran has said, has recently retired. Uh, and unfortunately, my position hasn't been replaced. Uh, and it is time to think about uh, the uh, institutional precarity and maybe to, to act, if you will, uh, toward ending these, uh, these situations for workers uh, in academic uh, circles. So um, with that, however, we'll go further into the archive. And what you can see here and what I invite you to look at uh, yourselves is to explore really the various different uh, different bits and pieces here. Obviously, we're in the home uh, page here, but then um, you will see, as I refer later on to the cataloging system start, uh, the archive is a searchable archive. It's searchable by items. Uh, it's uh, and when we say items, we are looking at really uh, the kind of sound recordings, uh, excerpts. And now, rather than going for the keywords, and I'll talk more about the the searchable uh, the search functions. You can see here as well that there is. Uh, possibility for you to search by tags. And these tags really um, uh, refer to what emerges out of uh, not only the cataloging system in terms of the category that are established ones, but also uh, it is a what uh, mathematicians call the bool search, which means that you can really uh, put anything in and uh, it will search the entire text. So we will come back to that later on. Um, so we are looking at the items here and what we'll see here is the collection tree. So it's not a real tree, as you can see, uh, but uh, in that it's a list rather than a tree. Um, so that by clicking on uh, the any uh, any of these, for instance, and just clicking on this one here, a bookmaker at the dogs in Belfast, uh, then you can see that uh, the material is organized in such a manner uh, that it corresponds to what a cataloging system would be. And we'll go back to that again. So if I go back then to the search items here and I enter, for instance, uh, let's say Blackpool um, to give credit to the people of the north side of Cork City, what you see is uh, a bunch of possible excerpts here that you can click on uh, and then that you can play. When uh, um, my Grandmother was a tenant at a Green Lane, which is down at the foot of the hill here. Yeah. And when the corporation demolished all the lanes, we came up here. This was in February 1964. My grandmother had died, and my father became the tenant. Yeah. But okay, I'll I'll leave you uh, guess what happens next. Uh, but. Uh, what I'm saying here is that you can really search from all sorts of different kind of uh, in different kinds of ways here. Uh, you can also, and Jamie will expand on that, but you can also search the material from the map. Uh, and again, uh, that will I will refer to that later on in terms of looking at uh, what we consider ethnographic maps. So. 
before I uh, go uh, to the second uh, to the second uh, slide here, again I refer to this uh, to this uh, uh, plaque here, Wisdom Lane, and that is a plaque that I noticed. Uh, obviously, that was put there when the lanes were closed uh, in Cork City. Uh, with uh, the new uh, gentrification process that has been happening over the past 20 years or so now. Uh, although when you look at North Main Street, you can't really say that it is uh, really gentrified as such yet. And thank God to a certain extent, uh, without really going into the nostalgia. Um, however, uh, what it means as well is that uh, I picked that particular picture, which I took when I saw it, uh, to refer to really a collection of the wisdom, really, uh, of the people that contributed their knowledge uh, to this archive and the knowledge of everybody that contributed to the archive from the people who contributed their memories and uh, their knowledge of traditional culture to the people who uh, collected the material, to the people who organized the material, to the people who digitized the material. Um, so that really we're talking about archives as being uh, central, if you will, to the research process in folklore uh, and in ethnology uh, from all these different kind of perspectives and from all these different avenues uh, from the collection really ultimately to what you have here, which is really the multimedia publication dimension of, of the work. Um, so that we are talking about uh, popular culture, really. And again, another picture, I, I, as Kiran mentioned, I like taking pictures and I'm kind of uh, like observing things. And I like this one because of, <laughs> well, well, uh, you know, looking at a, a different uh, version of what uh, Stefan has been looking at holy well. Well, this one is a Franciscan one. So there's a different sense of the holy, I suppose. Um, and uh, this uh, this particular uh, road here is a, a brewery here is at the the, uh, at the bottom of uh, Sunday's well, uh, which uh, again uh, was holy in a different kind of way. And again, what is important here is the multiple layers in which we can read, uh, if you will, folklore, in which we can understand folklore, in which we can interpret folklore. And so that in the beginning, uh, there was a meeting of like-minded people, and here I refer to the time when I first uh, uh, met uh, Garo de Cruley, and uh, I arrived in Cork initially the very first time I was here was in, in 1988, and I was still finishing my PhD, but uh, uh, I had met my late husband Seamus Cray and uh, came to Cork, and so where did we go? Um, we went to the Phoenix, we went to the pubs, and who did we meet? And we met Diarmid O'Giran, who was uh, in the folklore department, and of course the two knew each other. And uh, a week later, or two weeks later, Diarmid invited me to come up to the department and meet Gerard. So I went up, and I knocked on Gerard's door, and I heard, come in. And I thought, that's a strange accent of voice I heard before. And so I went in, and who was there? Only Peter Narvaez, who was one of my supervisors. <laughs> and we looked at each other, and we said, don't tell anybody when I'm here. Uh, Peter was doing uh, research on fairy lore at the time, uh, and obviously uh, I had escaped uh, from Memorial uh, to uh, do a little stint here in Cork. Uh, so by and by, uh, we started to chat and we started to talk and Peter was giving a talk. Uh, and that's when we started to talk about uh, an archive and uh, the, the possibility of setting up an archive, if you will, uh, in uh, the folklore, um, what would become eventually the folklore department here. So. How did we do that? Uh, 
we had a chat, uh, a long chat and many discussions uh, so that eventually uh, Garod asked me to put together a feasibility study. So that didn't come straight away because in the meantime, I had obtained uh, the, the, the PhD and then a, a postdoc uh, to do some research on uh, musician, uh, women musician traditions, a comparative postdoc, which uh, I'm looking at uh, putting online now. Uh, so this uh, feasibility study here uh, was then submitted uh, to uh, the um, powers at the university and to the hierarchy at the university uh, who had uh, the money. Uh, and as you can see here, that feasibility study looked at other different kind of uh, archives, including uh, obviously the one that I was working at at the time and that I was working in really uh, in uh, at Memorial University. So this was the Montfla uh, archive, as you can see. Uh, and again, you can go and uh, explore that archive as well. We refer to it a bit more. Um, at the time, uh, there was a program when uh, for postgraduate students uh, at Montfla, uh, at Memorial uh, University in the folklore department, we were all paid uh, to work 12 hours in the archive every week. So therefore, uh, there was the possibility, if you will, of having an archive. And besides that, then uh, there was also the core staff of the archive who had full-time jobs. So that was uh, really an important, uh, if you will, uh, number of people working on the collection, which is uh, incidentally one of the, the, the most important archives in North America, uh, folklore archives in North America, uh, besides uh, the one at the Library of Congress. And in fact, many people who worked in Manfla ended up um, working at the Library of Congress in the Folk Life Center. So there again, the reason why this is important is that uh, that means that all the uh, cataloging uh, practices, if you will, uh, are connected and come from, uh, I suppose, the uh, similar kind of ways, if you will, similar kind of ways of thinking of archives. So that here we're back to the sound archive again. And um, so that now we can also look at the various different uh, archives here. And I have put links to those. And again, when you see the when you see the, the, the presentation online, if you have a look at it online, you can enter uh, these uh, names here into your uh, search engines and they will lead to the various different archives uh, that really were very uh, important and very influential in the rating of the feasibility study uh, so that the knowledge again was connected to other folklore archives, not only in uh, Newfoundland, but also obviously here uh, in Ireland looking at the National Folklore Collection uh, nowadays, but also uh, looking at uh, the colleagues up uh, in Kultra uh, in the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum, uh, but then other colleagues and friends really also um, in uh, Turku, uh, a man called Pari Hutenen, who was a, a friend of Djermut and an archivist in uh, the uh, archive in Turku. Uh, and later on, we uh, met also and I met with the archivists uh, in Lund. Uh, so these were the acolytes, if you will, at the time and the people who helped shape uh, the, uh, the, the, the making uh, of uh, the archive here at UCC. Uh, coming back to what I was uh, saying earlier, also there was not only just uh, the practical dimension, if you will, but uh, when we said like-minded people, uh, not only the people 
who met that day, uh, but also um, the, our own, if you will, uh, influences from the point of view of our own philosophies, our own politics, our own ways, if you will, of considering folklore and archives. And here I can point to various different philosophers and, and uh, people who uh, reflected, if you will, on archives and the position of folklore. And these would be people like Jacques Derrida, Michel Foucault, uh, but also uh, people like Guy Biner, uh, here, uh, Neil Okoshan, uh, and then other anthropologists, French anthropologists like um, Godelier and Badiou, for instance, whom I'm sure uh, many of you would be um, familiar with uh, in anthropology. So um, the feasibility study uh, then was submitted uh, to uh, UCC, uh, and again, the influences of our earlier connections as well in terms of <clears throat> the people that we knew in common, myself and Garod and the others, but especially Kenny Goldstein, for instance, whom uh, folklorists will be very familiar with in terms of his earlier publication on a uh, guide for field workers in folklore. So uh, Kenny was uh, in Newfoundland uh, for a while and his daughter, Diane Goldstein, who is also a very uh, eminent folklorist, um, uh, head of, uh, I think, Indiana Folklore Department at the moment. And Diane was also on uh, my uh, PhD committee. So I was really surrounded by nice mind and uh, good heads, so to speak. And um, so that here we go back to this uh, other slide that I had a bit of fun with, uh, so that you can see uh, the, the location, if you will, of that that wisdom lane that goes straight into um, uh, Shandon and, uh, of course, uh, Connell Creedon, uh, Goldie Fish. Uh, well, not that Connell Creedon put that Goldie Fish there, but I uh, will uh, kind of suppose remind you of that series that Connell had on RTE for the longest time, uh, which really digged into the popular culture of, of Cork City, really an amazing, uh, an amazing piece of writing, let's say, um, that uh, I was hooked on as many were at the time. So the remarks here around the cataloging system, and I will come back to that, and that will somehow be the thread of uh, our discussion here, um, is that the cataloging system should strive to be as compatible as possible with other existing systems in other similar institutions. Uh, and also that uh, the cataloging system should be something that will eventually be expandable in terms of not only the representations of the various different categories, we're again in that notion, if you will, of uh, the, the organization of knowledge, if you will, but also the ways of tracing knowledge. Uh, you know, if we go into the etymology of, of that particular term, we go back, if you will, to uh, that that term that that traveled uh, back, uh, if you will, to uh, old English and French and Latin, and eventually back to Greek. Uh, but uh, to look at that etymology and to also look at that notion, that root, if you will, the catch, uh, that uh, means the, the picking, uh, if you will. So the, the picking, the searching here we have. Uh, so how will that uh, practice of cataloging uh, be expandable also in terms of facilitating, if you will, uh, not only the categories, uh, but also uh, the ways in which we will be able to access these categories and in which we will be able to pick these categories. So going back to what I was saying earlier, uh, it also means to make this accessible not only to uh, the scholars, uh, but obviously also to everybody who contributes to making this discipline a discipline, and remember that the notion of folklore is really is really a constructed 
uh, concept, if you will, uh, as, as a word itself. And of course, uh, again, we are not going. I'm not going back into the etymology here, but the construction of uh, that concept involves everybody. Uh, and involves not only the students, but also the makers, and we're all the makers, if you will, of, uh, of folklore. So because of that, we have many different ways of interpreting this word, and we have many different ways and different meanings that we assign to this word. Uh, and I remember back in Newfoundland when, um, before Peter came up with the idea of interstitial knowledge, uh, people in Newfoundland were, talk we were talking about all foolishness and that was the way, if you will, without being, uh, you know, derogatory, but at the same time with uh, that capacity to have uh, a, a jocular way of, of, of looking at these terms. Um, this is what sometimes uh, people refer to the, the term. And here you hear uh, the Irish term pishog uh, being used when you talk to people about folklore. Uh, you hear the various different kind of interpretations, if you will, of, of the term, the various different discussions around what it is. And uh, I want to stress here that nobody owns and nobody has, uh, if you will, uh, the uh, ultimate uh, definition of it. It is very much a fluid uh, a fluid definition. And therefore, uh, that also refers to the material that comes into our archives. The, these uh, these uh, collections are very fluid. They represent uh, the various different uh, different sets, if you will, of of uh, of situations, of positions, of minds, of expressions. Um, so that, uh, these reflections were very, very significant uh, in terms of establishing uh, our case, but also obviously uh, what is at the core of folklore case is establishing these cataloging systems, establishing these categories uh, that led, if you will, to these uh, systems. So meantime, uh, while I was thinking about this, I had still had to make a bit of money because there was no um, had no contract or any such thing at the time. And again, going back to you know the the, the precarious kind of situations of many young academics, um, I ended up and uh, in fact uh, trying. In fact, one time I remember ending up in uh, the uh, the doll office, uh, the doll office in, in Cork and crying and thinking, oh my God, you know, what am I going to do? Uh, but uh, then I met Mary Johnson, uh, who was also coming into the seminars and Mary Johnson, the wrestler, um, was uh, a, a person who was working as a social worker and she was originally from Lisbon, uh, in uh, the north and was at the time uh, um, studying uh, heritage uh, management in uh, in uh, UCC and UCC and she was a mature student. Uh, she was coming to these seminars that I'm sure many of you remember um, and uh, where we were all in this small room on one college road there in Elderwood, uh, one Elderwood rather in College Road. Um, and this very small room where the nice collection of brains uh, were uh, very active at the time. Uh, and uh, Mary was also involved uh, in a, uh, an oral history group in Notnahini. Uh, and uh, so she hired me as a process recorder. Uh, which again uh, meant uh, that I was uh, giving workshops uh, in uh, collecting and doing folklore, in doing oral history, but also observing how the whole uh, the whole group, if you will, how were we getting on, and how we were going to go about uh, about uh, recording this material, how. Will, uh, would, it was a, a women's oral history group and what were we going to do? So 
uh, ultimately this uh, collection of life stories uh, saw the light today uh, called Get a Life Girl, where we had uh, 12 uh, different women from uh, 12 different eras and uh, several generations uh, talking about their own life stories. So that was one of uh, the various different kind of projects I was involved in at the same at, at the time. Uh, the other one um, was um, Mehal Mara uh, and uh, Padraig uh, Odinin, who was involved uh, with Mehal Mara at the time. Uh, again, through the music we connected. Uh, and in these, uh, you know, sanctuaries in Cork City, the Phoenix being one of them at the time, um, be, um, Patrick uh, then was uh, thinking of organising the material that they had in Mehal Mara and uh, setting up, wanting to wanted to set up an archive and wanted to set up. Uh, a, a cataloging system around the material that they had, which was essentially really a collection of uh, articles and a, 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 a huge, uh, a, a huge kind of a library of material that they had uh, in uh, the various different boxes at the back of uh, the building that they had on the airport road. At the time, so that was the other uh, the other little kind of project that I was involved in at the time, and of course, uh, also uh, the connections, obviously, between all these projects was the musical connections, and as uh, many of you here also are involved and uh, active, brilliant musicians, really, um, and I think that uh, that really helps. Uh, I think we all have, in our departments anyway, uh, everybody uh, has their own connections uh, to the musical world. And uh, really, that is, as Nordic Casey was telling me last week, it really, looking, it really means looking at uh, activating a different kind of, a different part of the brain. So, um, which is what I'm going to try to do now. Um, so, the cataloging system now, um, I'm going to go a little bit more into that and I don't want to be too technical, but what I would like you to pay attention to is the connections and the similarities uh, between the various different ways and different versions really uh, of these cataloging systems. In folklore we talk about version and variations all the time. We talk about version of tunes and variations on the tunes as well. Uh, so here we are looking at the time back in the last century when we were organizing material uh, with uh, CAD systems. And what you can see here, and I'm not going to go into too many details, but uh, the important uh, uh, points here are the accession numbers. And, you know, this is the 701st one collection uh, accessed so catalogued in 1986 uh, in uh, the Memorial Folklore and Language Archive. Um, and so that we have the accession numbers and then we have various different uh, shelf numbers and the shelf numbers are here and you can see that uh, that allows for multimedia already. I talked about multimedia earlier and here I refer to the brain of Herbert Halbert who uh, was uh, at the time the uh, the, who had set up the archive in, uh, at Memorial and he had his office on the top floor and it was like going to see God when you went to see him for asking for, uh, you know, various different ideas and he had many, many books that he was trying to get us to read and it was an amazing, amazing time really um, to be able to, to go and, and, and dig into his own brain, let's say. But uh, he had that vision already of uh, setting up a multimedia archive in terms of separating the material and putting the, all the photographs together, all the manuscripts together, all the sound, well, what I later, we use the term sound recordings later on, 
but uh, you can see that it is uh, organized according to media so that basically each of these then also have a reference to the to the accession number so that you can put everything back into the one box if you need to. OK, uh, so the version here that you see then is what happened when I started setting up uh, the uh, the archive here. I used a similar kind of system. And of course, you know, this was the first collection to be accessed in 1995. You can see that we are gone from card here to Word. Uh, uh, processor and uh, Microsoft Word. Uh, this went through WordPerfect before it became Microsoft Word, but I skipped that little uh, that uh, little step. Uh, a year later, um, we uh, also saw um, a, the the the, um, the the North Side Folklore project uh, uh, took off, and that was uh, another. Uh, that is another side, if you will, that, that we don't have much time to go into, but I really encourage you to go on and uh, dig into the, to the website uh, and to the collections, multimedia collections of, the, of, of what has become now the Cork Folklore Project, which is a wonderful uh, collection of material uh, that is used uh, extensively by many, many uh, in Cork and beyond. Uh, so that... Uh, these two uh, these two cataloging systems uh, were meant really so that eventually uh, in the next century, uh, which is this one now, uh, we could have a system that could search all these uh, in from from the one uh, from the one platform, and eventually we will get there. I am sure. Um, so you can see that there are slight differences. Uh, in terms of the way not only the material is organized here, but um, you can see here that we have two digits and here we have four. Uh, um, so that if we look then at uh, what is behind this, and just as maybe a teaser to what's coming next, hopefully. Come on, come on, come on, come on. You have to talk to these things, um, but and they are not really OK. And um, so that you can see that later on, uh, these will be organized into uh, other forms, if you will, of a cataloging system that will lead to databases and to uh, to different ways of coding the material so that it can be, as I said earlier on, uh, um, digitized and it can be read through machines and uh, I'm sure that those of you who are involved in uh, library uh, system are familiar with the machine readable kind of cataloging uh, records and so on. So we had to then go back into <laughs> Met, I remember that, um, and it was like all the, the, all the, the mathematic uh, courses that I never listened to all of a sudden. They must have entered my brain from a different kind of ear, I suppose, uh, because I had to sort of try to get my head around that notion of XML, which is really uh, applied mathematics, uh, quite simple at the end of the day, really, uh, but uh, just a different way again of using the brain. And but I, I didn't kind of go too far deep into that when I realized that there were so many people who were so good at it that whew, uh, give me uh, time to breathe. Uh, so we'll go back here uh, from this particular. Uh, note in the way the accession numbers were written. So you had two and you had four. Why? Because at the time, remember, uh, there was the threat, you know, was it, a, you know, from going from, from fairies to gremlins uh, or, you know, looking at uh, the possibility that all oh, would come to an end comes the end of 
the uh, the first millennium and the 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 specter of Y2K was around. And obviously you can see that folklorists don't really believe in everything they collect as uh, the question was written here in somebody's handwriting, I think either Garlaud or Diermert. Are we going to throw this away? Are we going to really believe this crack? Um, I will admit that I didn't really, but then again, you're never too sure, you know. Uh, so that um, that's why I had the four digits in uh, the cataloging system in the Northside uh, folklore project at the time. So um, we uh, then uh, went on to looking at uh, establishing the connections then uh, between the various different kind of cataloging system and the technology we were learning the technology was was changing not every week but every month maybe there was new technologies and there was new ways it was really fast uh, so that we could now connect things with hyperlinks and we will try to do this and here we go um, that the, the, this is the today's result if you will uh, and hopefully my computer sound is still there and first of all we start on the line which is called the starting line and then at the other side which is an average of you say 18 and you can hear the voice of, of, of Tim Buckley there, uh, collected, uh, the, 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 his, his uh, life story uh, was collected by Ivor Neff, uh, who was a student of um, the folklore department here at the time. And incidentally, uh, Ivor's uh, son, Flory, uh, was very uh, helpful in setting up uh, the initial uh, the initial uh, digitization work that went into eventually setting up the LDL uh, project, which I will go to uh, in a few minutes. Um, you can see here, this is the an example of the shelf numbers and the sound recording catalogs. And you can see that at the time, uh, there was a field here for the duration, which meant that when the material could eventually be digitized, we would know exactly how long. And you, you could see from the, the little link there that I put the, uh, to the current system, uh, that how long was uh, the tape or how long was the sound recording really. So the connections as well here uh, in terms of looking at, uh, if you will, establishing ethnographic maps uh, and that meant uh, linking really uh, the area uh, to subject heading. Uh, again, that idea, if you will, was kind of at the back of my mind all the time and came from um, another uh, another uh, of my uh, lecturers in Newfoundland, Larry Small, and uh, Larry had studied anthropology and had introduced us uh, to uh, to human relation area files, uh, which uh, you can see here. I tried to get this into the library here, and for some reason, I don't know why, uh, people have been very reluctant, but uh, now that there is an anthropology uh, section in UCC. Hopefully, uh, people will go and will try to get uh, to these uh, files, which really are uh, connecting uh, the various different reports and the different kind of writings uh, of anthropologists uh, back to the back to uh, the end of the 19th century into the, 20, the early 20th century. It's really a wonderful tool, um, and um, so that was, if you will, one of the again, you know, the brain works in so many different ways. Uh, but that was very much at the back of my mind when I was uh, trying to uh, look into the future. Uh, so, but eventually, as I said earlier, there was uh, light at the end of the tunnel uh, and we could go from the technology of using from cards to uh, Word documents to eventually uh, looking at databases. And here are two examples. Um, this is, 
the access database. And again, everybody was using access databases at the time um, because it was part of a project that was called the ECDL, which was the European Computer Driving License. And everybody was using this. So we did. And uh, here, for instance, you have, you know, the cataloging system now is organized uh, into this uh, particular format. And uh, I, again, put in another kind of hyperlink here uh, that will uh, go to the, uh, to the folklore uh, archive here. And uh, again, I uh, invite you to listen to these uh, in your own time. And what you can see, uh, again, is the variety of different uh, topics, if you will, uh, that uh, we collected and that the students really collected. Uh, and this is going back to uh, 1988, really. And again, you can see the newer version, if you will, of that cataloging system with then the ethnographic map uh, that uh, you can uh, uh, that you can look at at the bottom of the of uh, the the site here. So I'm going to try to go a little bit faster. Um, so that you have one here and you have this other one here, which is really again, uh, you know, the 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 other the parallel kind of database. As you can see, the 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 the, the interface uh, is very similar. And uh, here we have the interface of uh, the project, the Northside Folklore Project at the time, uh, dated. Yes, and again, uh, eventually uh, there's hope that we will be able to search everything. But some, but that happened really. Remember, I was talking to you about this XML uh, uh, language, computer language uh, that allowed really to integrate several different kind of uh, projects together uh, that came together in this uh, documents of Ireland, which really was seven departments and nine different projects. Uh, and of course, uh, many of you are or still, obviously, uh, we know that uh, the, the, uh, the Irish, the School of Irish Studies is, is involved in many of these, obviously, uh, that are very active and very useful. Um, and I encourage everybody to, to use those. Uh, our own here was, we were always trying to find uh, acronyms that would bring money, right? Uh, because it was that that life really was also a life of writing grants, you know, grant writing. And uh, sure, everybody is involved in that still to the day. Uh, so that we had the... <laughs> uh, the the M cure, which for some reason when it was transferred here became M crew, but sure, you know, uh, I had nothing to do with Martin Cruz of any, uh, you know, description. But here we were linking the two. Here was a platform where we could link the two and search uh, the two uh, together. So I'll go to the folklore here. And again, you can see that uh, the, there was a, a simpler kind of way of organizing the material. And uh, I suppose that if you want to look at uh, the XML in action, uh, you, can, you can look at the way it is organized here. So there was the sound recordings and the photographs. And uh, of course, this is going to be recorded so you can slow down the the recording and spend more time uh, looking at that in your own time uh, as well before we go back to Newfoundland. Uh, and again, then uh, another possibility of getting money uh, was spotted by, by Garold. Uh, and uh, this was the Irish Newfoundland Partnership, uh, which was a, a kind of a, a a program at the time uh, where there were money uh, to uh, access uh, projects that would link with uh, Newfoundland. And I remember in UCC uh, there were two projects, and <laughs> we ended up going to Dublin myself and John O'Hanlon, who made it big. 
uh, and is heading the whole show now. Uh, so that here we have uh, the Ireland Newfoundland Partnership Project, and again, uh, you know, we could I'll just uh, put that on if you want to see uh, the or get a chance to read uh, more about what was involved in, in this project. Uh, you can do that by again uh, revisiting this tape, uh, this recording, and play it slow. Um, so that what you see, uh, and I will focus on the sound recordings there again, uh, a platform where you had uh, the sound files uh, from. Uh, this time the UCCF uh, uh, and uh, then uh, looking at the monthly uh, cataloging system. And you can see that, again, you had a similar kind of formats, if you will, and similar kind of ways of uh, looking at this. And again, to go back to what I was saying about the human relation files, uh, or the creation of ethnographic maps, uh, the possibility of looking at the subject list and the location list. Unfortunately, the money ran out and we couldn't go any further with this. Uh, what you can see is the subject list is really a subject list that is emerging from uh, the material that uh, was collected rather than looking at established categories, not saying that the established categories are not there, but uh, a lot of uh, a lot of um, time, if you will, was uh, spent. And of course, that's one of the major uh, pastimes, let's say, or major concerns of folklorists and anthropologists is looking at how do we categorize, you know, the categories where, uh, you know, it's one of the, when you do work that is comparative, uh, in essence, really categories are super important. So the next project really looked again at these categories and this time integrating the categories that everybody is familiar with um, from uh, the Handbook of Irish Folklore and the categories that really uh, are used uh, by the National Folklore Collection. You can see here on the left, and uh, that was then the work of the initial uh, projects of what became the, li 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 the LDL um, project uh, on Lendukas Lekronok uh, that Flory uh, Neff uh, was uh, one of the people involved in that, but also Carol Coleman and uh, many others uh, in uh, in uh, the uh, in the School of Irish Studies, uh, including Nule and Kiran and others. Uh, so the money is this time still spotted by Gerard, um, was uh, came from uh, various different sources, including the HCA. And you can see here, I had a bit of a screenshot of uh, the various different different, uh, you know, uh, uh, files that I had here. You can see that there was HEA uh, was one, uh, then there was a targeted initiatives, uh, then it became L the LHEA, LDL, I can't remember which came first, but anyhow, uh, eventually uh, the money started to come on its own. Uh, and we didn't have to reapply uh, anymore. We had achieved endangered species status. And so that uh, the uh, project then uh, started looking at the digitization of uh, the sound recordings and the material. And we had a whole kind of setup there uh, in uh, at the back of the office uh, on College Road. Uh, in the old chaplaincy building, and we had a real kind of uh, folklore alchemist kind of a um, setup there with all kinds of machinery and computers and systems that he would work every now and then. And then if it didn't work, we'd go for a cup of coffee, we'd come back, and it decided to work just like mine here. Uh, and so that we had a, a bit of money so that we could integrate all these three. Uh, projects here, the Lindukush Electronic, the Folklore Project, and uh, the Archive, and just showing to you one of the ones uh, 
uh, that, well, that, there was a CD-ROM <laughs> set up initially, which never worked because the technology was going faster than us. Um, so, Bosch, I'll just play you uh, one of the little films there that um, involved, uh, uh, again, many uh, different brains and the musicians, and this is Shana's uh, music here, but uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the photographs came from Guillermo's uh, Oberon and uh, I had, uh, I had the songs with to take this uh, tune uh, recorded by Shemus uh, Trayon and the tune is called from Shefo Mugola and I thought that was just kind of fitting to, uh, to the topic. Uh, so there was this little one here that you can visit yourself. But then there was also the films that were collected from and by the people in the folklore project at the time. And again, uh, using uh, the, the music of Seamus and Aiden. And this is Mr. Pudigan here uh, making, a, making a part. A, Okay, is it? Yeah. Uh, so a book is yeah, so it is. It's really good. Uh, so uh, the various different projects then came together, uh, if you will, in that uh, in that uh, wonderful resource that I again invite everybody to look at and to look into, uh, especially uh, very useful for uh, for teaching. And I'm gonna. Uh, I'm going a little bit uh, faster again here. Uh, eventually, and that's the cue for Jamie, um, eventually then uh, we digitized the material and uh, we then uh, looked at not only digitizing all the sound recordings so that we could have web files, but eventually uh, MP3 files, which were much more uh, condensed, compressed, uh, but then using the catalogs, the original catalogs, and then creating uh, the, um, the Excel sheets. And I'm going to try to show you here how basically these Excel sheets, no, it won't go. Yeah, uh, you can see then, you know, that it goes from the sound recording, you know, the, the, the digitized time, where does it start, where does it end, and the cues and so on, so that, uh, so that then uh, Jenny could uh, put together uh, the, the website uh, that uh, became um, our own uh, website here. So, uh, we practiced this so many times that hopefully this time it will work. And uh, I will hand here uh, the, the reins to Jamie. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to do that. Uh, yeah. uh, Jamie, can you hear me? Jamie should be able to take over just Yeah, there. I can, yeah. I'm just, yeah. Requesting, I'm just requesting to, to take over there. Okay. Oh yeah, so I stop sharing, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mary, you can see Is it me now? Computer sound. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um thank you very much, Mary Nick, for that, and thank you everybody for coming. Um <clears throat> and two seconds, this is gonna do the old usual. Um Um, so yeah, um, so yeah, just picks up where I kind of come in here. So uh, um, I'm an undergraduate from the, the um, Department of Folklore and Ethnology, and it was around, I suppose, about seven or eight years ago. I was in one of Marianne's um, uh, archive modules, um, and it was true, 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 true Marianne's um, kind of uh, knowledge and whatever that really sparked an interest in my own, in, in uh, my own interest in archives and archival work um, and as an undergrad I suppose when you're uh, kind of you're introduced to archives they're kind of daunting it's, I suppose the only thing I could kind of kind of put a, uh, kind of compare it to is like going into a record store as a, as a, as a young teenager or whatever and you're kind of in fear of, of these kind of 
place where all this kind of knowledge is kept and you know you're afraid to ask the person behind the counter or whatever but Marini kind of took away all that by um kind of giving us a good grounding in in, in what what goes down in like in cataloging and what so through through that module we got to learn uh, experience lots of different um archives we had the special collections in, in the bull or the national folklore collection core folklore project and lots of others but also around that time like so we're talking about 2013 i suppose 14 and um there was a, la a lack of online um or decent online um access to uh, archival material especially folkloric stuff and especially within ireland um at this point the national folklore collection hadn't the online presence that it has now to do with this .ie. and um so when i f finished my um degree in 2015 i went to work with the, the folklore project as a researcher and it was through discussions with uh, Dr. Clean O'Carroll, um, who had been Clean had been pushing to to, to get that the, this folklore project um, catalog online. Uh, we discussed how best to approach it, and what the, we came to the opinion that I'd be sent back to UCC to do a masters in digital humanities. Uh, and it's true, my learning there of um, you know kind of skills I learned the skills and tools. And kind of best practices to get that core folklore project catalog off the ground and, and online and so we got that's up there now and it's it's never you know, true due to its kind of life of the, the folklore archive it's always alive and it's always collecting so it's, it's never finished but at the moment there's uh 20 collections you know in excess of 300 items up there so it was through my work there that mary and Eek kind of comes back to me and says oh do you want to jump in here and, and help out with us getting the UCC folklore and technology archive up online. So I was, um, I, yeah, I took that opportunity. So here you see we have the the core folklore version um, and this Michael Galvan's uh, um, entry, and then on the, the the other side here we have um, the UCC. So you see we're, we're both we're both using the same platform, and I'm going to go on about that now in a second. Uh, so it's. Um, the, the the platform that we we use is um, Omika, which is a kind of a free open source um, web publishing platform. So it's a, a basically a content management system, uh, and it's designed for sharing digital collections and online ex ex exhibitions. Um, the, it 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 adheres to the Dublin Core metadata standard, which is the the, the, the simplest and widest used metadata scheme a, a kind of for online uh, data entry for. Uh, um, it follows uh, 15 core elements, which are kind of, uh, which I'll show you in a minute when we go into the into the archive. Um, uh, but it also has an extendable vocabulary, so you can get kind of greater specificity um, and so forth. So it, Omeka is designed for scholars, museums, libraries, and archives, and you know people like, and it's. It, its application to some a project like this is is is, is excellent, and uh, I'll go into it now in a second as I show two seconds. Um, so, as you can see, this is the kind of the back end of uh, the administrative kind of portal for for Omika. So, Mary Nika showed you the other side of it there, the, the front end there. So, here you can see this is the UCC. Uh, folklore and that uh, yeah, so you can see that there's 468 items up there you know, part of 174 collections so huge amount of co content up there huge um kind of uh wider range of topics and everything that um that it's been dealing with um so so the bit like the, the main kind of selling point of um of, of of omica um is that it does use this dublin core standard and like they sell it as this kind of flexible and extensible, uh, extensible kind of tool, uh, which it is. But the real value is the interop interoperability and the transferable aspect of of it. So basically, for example, like if if you know UCC was to close tomorrow and this archive was uh, the, the, is, is on the UCC servers, it would, would disappear. Let's say, but with using Dublin Core, we could scrape or let's say even if. For a less catastrophic example, let's say so, if the DRI, the, the, the Digital Repository of Ireland, wanted to uh, incorporate it in their holdings, they could scrape the metadata from from this instance of Omeka and upload it into a CSV file, which is 
it can be read as a, a, in Excel or, or however. Um, and then it can be easily uploaded to their system. So um, this, this kind of, this kind of future proofs the, 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 the data that we've, we've put in. So it, it's not like, you know, in, in other instances where you, 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 it's a bespoke or it's a, it's a different type of library system or management system where once it's gone, it's gone and it, 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 they won't speak to each other. Um, so this is it's kind of streamlined to, to, to do this. Um, so yeah, so here's the back end. So I'll just kind of give you a quick look at how uh, an entry would be put in, uh, in the simplest terms. So uh, bear with me now, internet, as we know this. Uh, so here we go. So, so um, as you see, it's this Dublin core. Yeah, and then you can have enter uh, additional types of metadata, which we do, we would do because the Dublin core is quite um, quite generic in space, but it, it, it's 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 it fits its purpose. Um, so you get your title, your subject, your description, you know, creator, source, publisher, date, contributor, rights, relation, format, and so on and so forth. So as I said, there's 15 elements to go in there, and then you can also um, add and other types, so as you can see, there's different types here. We use your history metadata type because it, 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 it covers what we need. So there's interviewer, interviewee, location, transcript, and so on and so forth. So that's, you enter in the relevant data there, like let's say Mary Nick had from those old um, catalog uh, cards and the Word documents that she had and so on and so forth. So that we, we took those that information and fed it into here. So I'll just give you an example of what it looks like in the back end here. Once it's so the highlighted in blue is all the um, uh, Dublin Core. So it's title description. It's an interview with Reverend John Lamb, parish priest, about how house illumination. So it's very important. Here's the extra um, information then. So, so that's what it looks like here. It's very simple. You know, you get your tags, and you enter it in like that, and it's time consuming. It's whatever, but Omika really does kind of. Um, uh, streamline, you know, just l less. Uh, like she was showing you the XML sheets there with all that machine learning and stuff like that. That's kind of pushed to the side here, and and, and you're focusing on a more streamlined version and easier for her to kind of be every day. So with Omika, it's easier for us in the admin side of the things to get things done, but it's also easier to use on the on the front end side, which I'm going to show you now. So like if, over here. so this is the the users. Um, view of what, what we were just looking at in the, in the kind of administrative view there. So um, you know, here, as you see, it's all the same information, but it's just in a more kind of uh, aesthetically pleasing uh, 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 means. And as you said, it has this mapping at the end as well. So look, I'm just kind of how we've done it as well as we didn't want to um, clutter. Uh, Marinique wanted to have lots and lots of clips uh, 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 and excerpts from from each entry. Um, but that would have uh, cluttered up the catalog entry in, 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 in the user interface. So we decided to kind of have a second sheet uh, of clips to go to. So um, we have that. So, so here you, you click on John Lamb. Sorry. I remember that, uh, that pulley lamp. I've seen that a good deal now in shops, old fashioned shops and thurlers. But anyway, and if, if with that, then, you know, if you're interested, oh, that's touching off. Well, well, you can go into an extra page and then there's a, an extra bank of clips or excerpts um, in here then so dealing with that so um, so yeah so that's so that's that part but um uh, what I want to say as well that like in a uh, with the pandemic this kind of um, remote access to archives is really um, you know, it's, it's 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 a big thing now because, as we said for the last year, we've been in kind of lockdown, and researchers and students and stuff haven't been able to access this material. So it kind of has fallen in the right time that we got in the last four or five years that this has come together to get this online because without such kind of instances and in uh, online portals, um, a lot of people's work would have ground to a halt. So, um, but now you know we have this this means of constantly been able to access material now, whether or not there's an archivist on the other end to disseminate that material in a fuller sense 
um, that, that, that needs to be seen, but at least there is some uh, first port of call to, 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 to do that. So um, I can, I'm kind of conscious that we've kind of run over time, so I think I might just uh, lick it back over there uh, to the powers. So, um, so Mary Nick, do you want to jump back in there? Yes, uh, I'll try my back. Hello. Yes, you are indeed. Yeah. Oh, back, okay. there, yeah. back. Okay. So I'm gonna share my computer again. Do I? <laughs> I'll include computer sound. Um, and see where my desktop. Okay. So thank you, Jamie. And again, I know you had a lot more uh, to contribute. And in fact, the five minutes are really. Uh, not doing justice to the amount of work that you've provided in uh, making these things possible and feasible, and uh, especially uh, achieving that that earlier dream, really, of linking the two projects together, uh, thanks to, again, the advance uh, in technologies and uh, uh, the ways that we managed, uh, and I'm using the French we here, everybody uh, participated in uh, looking at and in managing uh, these various different um, different uh, forms of uh, of material really and these different different uh, kinds of uh, uh, languages uh, which uh, helped if you will bringing the 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 systems from the card catalogs to uh, the system that Jenny has described here. So again, that is, and you made the point, and it is truly a point of very important, uh, important uh, dimension here, that really not only uh, folklore should be central, ethnography should be central uh, to uh, university foundation courses, that it should be really a course that should be available to every to all and every uh, subject and every department and every form of science really uh, in a university. Uh, and at the core of that are these archives. And as we know, and you're right, uh, in somehow, you know, the situation we're in uh, means that we are more and more and more dependent, as you could see at the start of this, of the internet, on the internet, and certainly uh, on the archives for our, uh, for our sources of knowledge. Um, so we're back to uh, Wisdom Lane here. Uh, just wanted to point out uh, to one uh, little article that I wrote at the time uh, back a couple of years ago, five years ago, wow, uh, e that is published in Bieskine, uh, which is the journal of uh, the folklore department, uh, Ron and Beard, just that is also online, this article is online. The journal is available to all through the department and it's a wonderful publication uh, that uh, Kiran uh, is uh, editing for us. Um, so just again, uh, you can access that uh, online. Um, so back to Wisdom Lane. And really, I invite you to uh, to dig into this uh, archive uh, as often uh, as uh, you can. Uh, it will be very useful to uh, your studies. Uh, and just to finish, I would like to thank everybody um, that helped me put this together and these uh, start from uh, the lecturers and the teachers back uh, in Newfoundland. Uh, of course, the students uh, with whom I, uh, you know, discussed many, many, many of these uh, issues with and from whom I learned a lot. Uh, all the technicians, all the magical helpers, uh, all the colleagues uh, all over the world, really. Uh, and everybody has such brilliant brains that uh, really helped me to put this together. And without the music and the poetry, you would get nowhere. So um, that I want to end this with a quotation from Louise Michel, 
uh, who was in the commune in uh, 1871. Plus les communications universalisent et mieux cela vaut pour chacun, meaning that the most universal communication becomes the better it is for each and every one of us. And I think that it is very significant in our days. Uh, she wrote this pamphlet called L'Air Nouvelle, which you can find on the internet. I don't know if it is translated, but it was part of our prison journal when she was in New Caledonia. Uh, at the time, uh, she did uh, a bit of ethnology there as well, uh, working and uh, documenting uh, the life of the Kanak people uh, uh, there in New Caledonia. And remember that they're having a referendum, again, the third part of a referendum there uh, for their own autonomy uh, from the French government colonized uh, that part of the world. So thank you very much. I'll leave it back to Kiran now and uh, I'll hand the mic back to the stage manager. For me, Mahagut Marini. Hold your road, Kiran. We're, we're delighted. We didn't want to. We didn't want to let you go without without you taking a bit of time with the school and showing us exactly what what's available for us. This rich treasure that's available for us now on the uh, on the on the on the department's website. So many many thanks for 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 all of that work. It's it's incredible. You know, one thing it's one thing to to digitize the material. It's quite another then to as you've shown us there to go through all of those steps to make the material searchable, you know, so it's one thing to have it up there and, and available, but then to have it searchable also. There's a tremendous amount of credit going to you and all of the team involved uh, in getting that up there and available. It makes me very proud that all of that material is, is actually available for us now. Um, you touched on some really interesting things. I know that people may have questions. Uh, I was particularly interested in